The year is 897, and Pope Stephen VI has ordered the eight-month-old corpse of his predecessor removed from its vault at St. Peter's. The former and very dead Pope is clad in his own pontifical garments and placed on a throne in a Roman basilica and put on trial. A few decades later, if you can believe the annals of Winchester, King Edward the Confessor accuses his mother of adultery but Edward's mother proves her innocence by walking barefoot over red-hot plowshares. And fast forward to 1386 in Paris, where the king's court resolves charges of rape and defamation by having the accused and his accuser mount horses for a jousting battle. The two men will go at it until one or the other is dead. Whoever wins the battle, all agreed, will be vindicated as a matter of law. Strange doings. Medieval trials seem very curious to the modern mind. Today we're going to survey three of these peculiar trials, trials spanning roughly half a millennium. Our goal is to make sense, if sense can be made, of the unusual means for resolving conflicts and punishing bad actors in the Middle Ages. What were these people thinking? How did it come to this? Ancient Greece and ancient Rome each had pragmatic and evidence-driven methods for resolving disputes and criminal charges. What happened? Well, what happened in the first half of the 6th century was that a curtain fell on the ancient world. In the 530s, the Black Death swept through much of Europe. Soon marauding barbarians entered the continent. They killed, conquered, and converted and, in the process, the invaders transformed Europe's systems of justice. The relatively sensible approach to crime found in ancient Rome gave way to something very much different. Our tour of the strange world of medieval justice starts with the Cadaver Synod of 897, or, as many have come to call it, the Dead Pope Trial. The mid to late 800s were a very bad time for popes. Charlemagne's empire had crumbled and Europe had split into smaller and smaller fiefdoms. Many of these fiefdoms eyed Rome's treasury and sought protection money. Because of Rome's weakened condition, popes in the late 800s depended on the support of secular leaders. It was a time of political factions. A pope had to be aligned with the right faction to accomplish much of anything. In this turbulent time, Bishop Formosus of Portus, Portus being a western suburb of Rome, was making a name for himself in Catholic circles. In the 860s, the Pope called on Formosus to manage important church matters in Bulgaria, France, and Trent, and each time he received high marks for his work. So much so that people began mentioning Formosus as the candidate for Pope when the next vacancy opened up. But when an opening occurred in 872, the papacy went to a rival, Pope John VIII. Formosus soon found himself on the wrong side of the issue as to who should be crowned the new emperor, and he had to flee Rome. Pope John VIII convened a synod and charged Formosus with a laundry list of crimes under church law. Among the charges was deserting his diocese without permission, opposing the crowning of the emperor, and, quote, conspiring with certain iniquitous men and women for the destruction of the papal see. Formosus was convicted, defrocked, and excommunicated. Now you think that might be the end of papal ambitions for Formosus, but you'd be wrong. Six years later, the excommunication was lifted in return for, Mo for Formosus promising to never return to Rome or to execute his priestly duties. And for a while, he didn't. But then in 882, Pope John VIII was clobbered over the head with a hammer, thus becoming the first pope to be assassinated. Newly installed Pope Marinus didn't share his predecessor's grudge with Formosus. He released Formosus from his oath and restored him to his old diocese. Three more popes came and went. They seemed to drop dead with 
alarming regularity around this time, until at last in 891, Formosus became the first former excommunicant to be elected pope. But the job came with a host of thorny problems. The most important concerned the messy politics of the church and the Holy Roman Empire. The previous pope had made a commitment to crown as Roman emperor the young Guy III of Spoleto. But Formosus had his own idea as to who should be emperor. And Formosus persuaded Arnulf of Carinthia to invade Italy and liberate it from the control of Emperor Spoleto by force. The deed done, Pope Formosus crowned Arnulf as the new emperor. Spoleto dropped dead and was out of the picture, but nothing about what Formosus had done sat well with Spoleto's influential relatives. Two months after crowning Arnulf as emperor, Pope Formosus died of a stroke. For eight months, his corpse rested peacefully in the vault at St. Peter's. But in January 897, power shifted again. Arnulf suffered a stroke and left Rome. And once again, Spoleto's relatives were riding high. And they had not forgotten what Formosus had done to them. They didn't mean to let a little thing like his death get in the way of revenge. Spoleto's relatives put pressure on the new pope, uh, Stephen VI, to put Formosus on trial for a list of alleged crimes. It might not have taken a lot of pressure. Pope Stephen VI, then Formosus, had been on opposite sides in disputes involving Rome's arist aristocracy. Pope Stephen calls the meeting of bishops and cardinals, and it's called the Notorious Cadaver Synod. At this meeting, it is decided to remove the rotting co corpse of Pope Formosus from its vault. Church aides remove the shroud from the corpse, dress it in pontifical vestments, put a crown on its skull, and prop what's left of Formosus on a throne in the Basilica of St. John Lateran. One can guess how shocking this sight must have seemed to bishops and cardinals called as witnesses. In addition, imagine them struggling to deal with the overwhelming stench. Pope Stephen appoints himself prosecutor and appoints an 18-year-old deacon to serve as counsel for Formosus. What happens next is described by E.R. Chamberlain in his entertaining book, The Bad Popes. The counsel wisely kept silent while Stephen raved and screamed insults at the corpse. The charges against Formosus include performing the functions of a bishop after he promised not to, assuming the papacy, and conspiring against the previous pope. Among the list of questions Pope Stephen has for the corpse are, why did you usurp the universal Roman see in such a spirit of ambition? Why did you exercise the office of bishop after you took an oath to remain a layman? Why did you commit perjury? Apparently, dead Pope Formosus had no good answers for these questions. So Pope Stephen proposes that Formosus be found guilty. The bishops present don't see any reason to disagree. They all shout, so be it. Guards step forward to carry out the sentence. The three fingers of the corpse that Formosus once used for blessings are hacked off. The papal crown is removed and the papal garments stripped off. A short time later, the body is tossed in the Tiber River. But dead popes don't just fade away. The aftermath of the trial had many twists and turns. For example, monks sympathetic to Formosus fetch the corpse from the river, and rumors began to circulate that the corpse was performing miracles on the banks of the Tiber. Bishops appointed by Formosus and still loyal to him staged a Vatican coup, and the mob tossed Pope Stephen into the dungeon, where he was strangled. Subsequently, the decrees of the Cadaver Synod were first annulled and then reinstated by different popes. Formosus's corpse was returned to its vault, but then exhumed and tossed into the Tiber River again. Eventually, Formosus's bones found their way back to St. Peter's, where he was laid to rest for a third, and one would hope, final time. The cadaver synod dampened enthusiasm for trying corpses. In 898, Pope John IX even issued a decree 
prohibiting the future trials of the dead. But even so, Pope Formosus was not the last person to show up dead for his trial. Over the next several centuries, scores of other cadavers had their days in court. So what was behind these trials? Why, in the Middle Ages, why would anyone try a dead pope or a dead anyone? In part, such trials reflect medieval beliefs about death. Death is not the end. People move on to their rewards and punishments in the next world. And part of the interest in trying dead people can be attributed to laws that allowed the confiscation of property of persons convicted, dead or alive, for serious crimes. Okay, the cadaver synod was something of a special case. What about trials of non-popes, including ordinary people accused of committing ordinary crimes? In these cases, most of Europe turned to systems of justice that produced results that are just only if God took enough interest in a case to provide it. Briefly put, there were two techniques, each semi-rational at best, that came into use. The earliest trial form to develop was trial by oath, or more precisely, trial by compurgation. In these trials, a person accused of a crime tried to round up people willing to swear to his or her innocence, people called compurgators. The number of oath takers required to prove innocence varied with the seriousness of the charge in one's place in society. These trials were not fact-based inquiries. The oaths were the evidence. Even the high and mighty had to seek out compurgators. For example, in 899, Queen Uta of Germany stood accused of adultery. She won acquittal, however, when 72, or 82 by some counts, knights lined up to confirm her chastity. Trials by oath made sense for people who believed God would strike dead anyone who swore falsely. But objections to the system, people understood perjury was at least possible, led to another form of trial process, trial by ordeal. And from the ninth century on, the use of ordeals spread and often replaced compurgation altogether. Trials by ordeal bear almost no resemblance to modern trials. They were proceedings designed to attract God's attention and have him make the call, guilty or innocent. If a defendant was truly innocent, the thinking went, God would step in and perform a miracle to show that the defendant was without guilt. Trials by ordeal were not some sort of wink-wink proceeding. Most people of the medieval world actually believed that God would ensure a just outcome. God was ever watchful. People could scarcely imagine God just sitting by and letting an innocent person be found guilty. In a trial by ordeal, the defendant was subjected to a challenge with the potential for causing serious injury. A typical ordeal might involve walking over hot irons or retrieving a stone from boiling water. The defendant was determined to be innocent if the injury healed within a specific time, three days was typical, and guilty if the injury still festered. The ordeals took a variety of forms. For example, consider the ordeal of the cold water. Authorities tossed bound suspects into a body of water to see whether they sank or floated. Because the water was believed to be pure and have the power to repel sin, anyone who sank persuasively enough was acquitted, and with luck, might be resuscitated and live to see another day. Although there are numerous references to trials by ordeal, few detailed accounts survive. One account that does is no doubt highly fictionalized. It is an account in the Annals of Winchester, written about 1200, about the ordeal of Queen Emma of Normandy. That is more than a century after Emma's death. Plenty of time for a legend to grow. But according to the annals, King Edward the Confessor charged his own mother, Emma of Normandy, with adultery. Specifically, he alleged that Emma engaged in sexual relations with Bishop Elfwine of Winchester. Emma insisted she was innocent. And to prove it, she was willing to undergo the ordeal of the hot iron. The Archbishop of Canterbury agreed, but with rigorous conditions, quote, Let the ill-famed woman walk nine paces with bare feet on nine red-hot plowshares, four to clear herself and five to clear the bishop. If she falters, if she does not press one of the plowshares fully to her feet, 
If she has harmed the one least bat bit, then let her be judged a fornicator. Now that's one tough test. So here's the scene. The nine red-hot plowshares are laid out across the pavement in the church. Emma enters and entreats God to save her. Led by the hand of bishops, she starts to walk. Miraculously, according to the chroniclers, Emma passes the test with flying colors. Emma, in fact, senses nothing. She even turns to the bishop and asks, when shall we come to the plowshares? The bishop, stunned by her question, tell her that she has just passed over them. Her feet are examined, or so the report goes, and are found not to be injured. All around proclaim a miracle. Emma is innocent of the charge and free to go with all her confiscated property restored. Now take that story with a grain of salt. Perhaps the plowshares were not as hot as the archbishop ordered. Perhaps Emma's feet were toasted, but less so than expected. Perhaps the ordeal never even occurred at all. But it is true that the Catholic Church took to trials by ordeal with gusto. The use of ordeals expanded in the 9th through 11th century as Latin Christendom spread in Europe. The Church came to see trials by ordeal as a handy way of dealing with heretics. Want to prove you're a good Catholic? Take the ordeal of the hot irons. The church realized another benefit from the system. Priests frequently were paid to supervise ordeals. Although the evidence is scant on this, it seems that trials by ordeal were fairly given to a high exoneration rate. Priests had a lot of latitude to make judgments, even assuming the ordeals themselves were not manipulated, as of course they could be. Has a wound healed enough to prove innocence? That could be a question without a clear answer. Perhaps a bribe might influence the final call. Given the discretion here, woe to the poor defendant undergoing an ordeal who had crossed the priest in some way. One variation of ordeal still captures our imagination. Trial by combat. Now, two things distinguish trial by combat from all the other varieties of ordeal used in the Middle Ages. First, most ordeals were unilateral, involving one party only. It takes two to duel. Second, for a defendant in most forms of ordeal to prove innocence, he or she had a hope that the natural processes worked in a surprising way. Not so with trial by combat, where skill and cunning could make all the difference. The last great example of trial by combat took place in 1386 at an abbey north of Paris, where royalty, dukes, and thousands of ordinary Parisians gathered to watch a bloody spectacle. To say that the two combatants, Jean de Carouges and Jacques Legree, had a history is an understatement. At one time, the two men were close friends. So close, in fact, that Carouges chose Legree to be the godfather of his first son. But things deteriorated when both men were in the court circle of Count Pierre d'Alençon. Legree became the Count's favorite vassal. The, co the Count rewarded Legree with a prized estate and other favors, making Carouges jealous. Carouges fell in love and married the daughter of a Norman lord. His new bride, Marguerite, was a great catch by all accounts. She is described as young, beautiful, good, sensible, and modest. It turns out that Marguerite's father used to own a valuable estate. Her father sold the estate to Count Pierre, who in turn handed it over as a gift to Carouge's arch-rival, Legree. Carouge's sued Legree, arguing that the transfer was null and void, but the lawsuit went nowhere. It was just the first of several messy land disputes between Carouge's and Legree. But in 1384, Carouges and Legree had a chance meeting at a party. Maybe it was the wine, but the two agreed to bury the hatchet. Carouges even introduced Legree to his beautiful wife, Marguerite. Big mistake. Two years passed, and then one day, while Carouges was on a trip to Paris, Legree visited the chateau where Marguerite was staying, home alone. Here's one version of what happened next. 
Marguerite answers a knock at the door. The door knocker is a man at arms named Adam Louvel. Louvel questions her about a loan for a minute, and then he announces, surprise, Jock Legree is waiting outside and he really would like to see you. Marguerite declines the offer. But Louvel persists. He loves you passionately. He'll do anything for you. He really, really wants to see you. Marguerite still says no. Legree barges in anyway. Then, according to Marguerite, he propositions her. He sweetens the offer by throwing in a goodly sum of money if they can just have sex and keep mum about it. Again, Marguerite says no. Legree, with his aide's help, then proceeds to rape Marguerite. Legree threatens Marguerite. Don't tell anyone, including your husband. He throws a sack of coins on her bed. Marguerite throws it back at him, and Legree leaves. Perugia's returned several days later, and despite Legree's threat, Marguerite could not keep silent. She tearfully told her husband that Legree had raped her. No doubt this news made Perugia's fighting mad. It didn't help that Marguerite added that she was newly pregnant. Cruz has decided to press charges of rape. But the suit had a problem. First, there was the he said, she said aspect of it. Marguerite was the only witness. The agree would surely deny the rape. Second, the judge for the case would be none other than Count Pierre. And Pierre had the authority to resolve disputes between his vassals. And we can guess whose side Pierre would take. The deck was stacked so steeply against them that Carouges and Marguerite didn't even bother to attend the proceeding. Predictably, the Count acquitted Legree on all charges and accused Marguerite of dreaming up the attack. But the Count's verdict could be appealed to his overlord, King Charles VI. Guessing that a traditional appeal would fail, Carugias came up with another plan, a plan that might prove attractive to the king and his court's lust for entertainment. Carugias proposed that the rape charge be settled through trial by combat. Now, trial by combat had once been a fairly common means of resolving disputes in France, but by 1386 they had become very rare. A law passed in 1306 limited them to cases involving noblemen and capital crimes. Carugias probably expected his idea to be rejected. But the French court was intrigued. A good old-fashioned trial by combat might be fun. Carugias and Legree and their respective supporters showed up at the Palace of Justice to issue a formal challenge. Before the king's court, a body of 32 magistrates, they each recited their accusations. Carouges accused Legree of rape, and Legree accused Carouges of defamation. Carouges then threw down his gauntlet. Literally, throwing down a gauntlet was the formal indication of a man's willingness to fight. Legree picked it up, signifying his acceptance of the duel. The king's court determined that the case should be heard first as an ordinary criminal one. The trial dragged on through the summer, but finally the king's court handed down its verdict or non-verdict. It announced it could not reach a decision, a judicial duel to the death it would have to be. Now when you hear the word duel, you might think of something like the Hamilton Burr duel, a couple of men deciding for their own foolish reasons to settle scores in a violent way. But this was a judicial duel, a form of ordeal that assumed God would be watching over and directing the outcome. In this judicial duel, not only would the survivor survive, he would be, in the eyes of God and of the law, vindicated. It wasn't just the lives of the two men that hung in the balance. Marguerite's life did, too. If her husband died, that meant her rape accusation was baseless and that she had committed perjury. And perjury was a capital offense. So Marguerite knew that if her husband lost the duel, she would be immediately burnt at the stake. If ever a wife had a reason to cheer her husband on in battle, Marguerite had one. And so the big day arrives, December 29, 1386. Thousands of spectators gather at the jousting arena. King Charles is there. So are an impressive collection of dukes. 
Marguerite, dressed in black, sits in a carriage overlooking the field. The two combatants, dressed in full armor and each riding a horse, take the field. Each man has a set of weapons. They each carry a lance, a sword, a long dagger, and a heavy battle axe. Cruges recites to the crowd his charges against Legree. And then it's Legree's turn, and he recites his charge of defamation. Each man dismounts his horse and gives oaths to God and the Virgin Mary and to St. George. The oaths ensure God's judgment, and not just their own jousting skills, will determine the outcome of the duel. The king's instructions are read. Essentially, the deal is this. Anyone who runs onto the field and interferes with the duel will be executed, and anyone who interferes with the duel by shouting will have their hands cut off. Effective crowd control measures, no doubt. And then it's showtime. The horses square up at the proper distance. The marshal signals. The two men charge at each other. On the first pass, their lances strike, but no harm is done. On the second pass, they strike each other on their armored headpieces. They wheel around and charge at each other a third time, striking each other's shields and shattering both lances. The axes come out in round four. They slash at each other with axes until Legree manages to drive his through the neck of Carouge's horse, beheading it. The poor horse stumbles to the ground and Carouge jumps off. He charges at Legree's horse and disembowels it. You have to feel for the horses. Then it's time to pull out the swords and the battle begins on foot. The two men thrust and parry and all those other things you do with swords. This goes on for several minutes. Legree gains the advantage after he manages to stab his rival in his right thigh. But Carugia's isn't finished yet. He wrestles Legree flat to the ground. Not a very good place to be if you're wearing heavy armor. Carugia's stabs his rival right and left, but he's not getting anywhere. The armor is just too tough for the sword. So he tears Legree's faceplate off and shouts at his old nemesis. Admit your guilt, you fiend. Legree cries out, In the name of God and on peril of damnation of my soul, I am innocent. That does it. Carugius takes out his dagger and drives it through Legree's neck, killing him. Marguerite, watching all this, must be relieved. But before the victor can receive congratulations from his wife, he's bandaged up by his pages and walks over to the king. Cruises kneels before the king and accepts his prize of a thousand francs. He limps off to bow and clasps his wife as the crowd shouts its approval. Finally, the happy twosome ride off from the jousting field to the Cathedral of Notre Dame to thank God for securing them justice. And with that, the curtain came down on trial by combat in France. Never again would the French government sanction a judicial duel. Each of the trials we've examined was exceptional. The cadaver synod exceptional in its grotesqueness. The trial by ordeal of Emma of Normandy exceptional for its reported outcome and the high status of the accused. And the Carouge's Legree trial of combat by combat exceptional for being the last trial of its kind in France. Each trial appears crazy to the modern mind. But the mindsets of the men and women of the medieval age were decidedly not modern. Even as early as the ninth century, trials by ordeal have skeptics. Skeptics who questioned whether God actually had much interest in stepping in to make sure that every ordeal came out as it should. Charlemagne must have noted the criticism when he commanded, let all believe in the ordeal without doubting. As historian Robert Bartlett observed, the commandment would scarcely have been necessary if there were no doubters. By the late 12th century, criticism of ordeals grew. Couldn't God secure justice if he wanted without ordeals? Aren't they just superfluous? Isn't it presumptuous to assume we can determine God's will from a test we made up? Might not a guilty person use magic to falsely win his innocence? Isn't it possible God might choose to sit an ordeal out? 
If someone who is guilty confesses, shouldn't that cleanse their guilt and result in an ordeal showing them to be innocent? What if three suspects are made in turn to walk over hot irons? Doesn't the last suspect have a much better chance of being found innocent than the other two? And where in the Bible exactly is support for this whole notion of ordeals? These critical voices began to be heard at the highest levels. In 1199, Pope Innocent III approved a new way of proceeding in criminal cases. The new proceeding was called the Inquisition. Sixteen years later, the Fourth Lateran Council prohibited priests from blessing ordeals by fire or water. The age of the trial by ordeal was closing. 